Council of Files Office of Legislative Council, and we're still looking at draft 1.6 strike all amendment to S54. Um, and I think where I'd like to take you is um, to the section on the uh, Canvas Registry. So if you look at page 39 in the highlighted language, so this was uh, with respect to, uh, to recall that the reason this language is in here is that as of January 1st, 2021, the medical registry would shift over under the purview of the board from the Department of Public Safety. And you'd also have the, the commercial retail up and running shortly thereafter. And then for there's kind of a, a, a scaled down version of the registry and then the board would be adopting rules at the same time that they'd be adopting rules for the other programs. And one of the things in here was that in the in the bill as introduced, the, um, the definition basically for the qualifying condition to get on the registry was a definition that the Senate had passed a few times previously in various medical uh, canvas bills um, where it was broadening the definition for the qualifying condition to include basically anything that your healthcare provider determined was appropriate. And the Medical Society, I believe, that testified against that. Senator Sierra asked me to go back to the existing language, so that's what I've done. So what you've seen on page 39 for the definition of qualifying medical condition, so that term is different than is what is currently used, which is debilitating medical condition. And so we're changing the names to be qualifying medical condition, but the definition, so what you see on line 7 through 17 on page 39 is the definition under current law. And that, because we will have a medical marijuana bill, so we have time to deal with the district. Yep. So uh, next change is on page 40. And you see at the bottom of the page, uh, subsection C, and this has to do with information in the registry that would be exempt from uh, <coughs> public inspection. And that's language that you've already seen from Senate Gov Ops. But Am I on draft 2.1? 1.6. 1. 1.6. 1. 1. No wonder. Do we have a draft 2.1? Well, I have one. A draft 2.1. <coughs> oh, I think it's. I think it's. Copy. Huh? How did it? Let's see. Let's see. 2.3. No. No. 1.6. 1. 1. <coughs> Since uh, the date is February 13th. Oh. Do you have your right folder? Yeah. Marijuana? Yeah. Uh -huh. I get the bill is introduced. Something happens. And it's my fault. It's the Kremlin's coming at night. No, I just, I just took one of those days. Mm -hmm. I got draft 1.22. No. I think you're probably looking at maybe earlier versions of the bill before it was introduced. Yeah, oh, before it was introduced. Peggy, do you just have an extra copy? I don't know. I can print it. It's just, it's. Well, Here, would you like my to no, no. use my copy? Why well, I don't have my copy. Everything else here, but something happened. I know what you're. Go ahead. Go through it. Maybe um, just print me a copy of the yeah. bill. So just on this Probably is just took it out to take it to something and <laughs> So the language on the public records exemption with regard to the registry is essentially what they do now. So there's certain you know, in, in terms of individual needs and identifying information about patients and caregivers would be exempt so that information would not be publicly available. And you see at the top of page forty one there's the language again that they that we have currently, which is that in response to a uh, person specific or property specific inquiry by law enforcement, then that information would be able to be released to them. So it could be that neighbor, neighbor, neighbor calls and says, well, I see cameras going in my backyard or something, and they've got you know, more plans than I think they're supposed to be able to have under the, under the, the regular law and then law enforcement could maybe that person doesn't have a copy of their medical uh, registry or you know a card or something. Maybe law enforcement can help and check on that. 
Um, that's how it goes currently. Mm -hmm. So the next change is page 45. Uh, actually, on 41, there was highlighted stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, before you leave that, then. Okay. Um, on line three, it says the board may verify. Just curious, um, is it uh, why may? Um, that's how it's structured now at the I mean, I'm fine with May. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, like, right back, like, so I if, because it stresses that it's a bona fide investigation. Mm -hmm. But then it's, I think it's fine to change it to that. Well, I, I would leave May. I would leave May, too. I mean, yeah. it just may curious. well be that the person whose case it is, you know, would really, maybe they want them to get the photo of Check it out. Yeah. I mean, I can say I've never, they, I have, in staffing all this, I haven't heard anything uh, Any problem with you know, from the department that they've had an the issue with it. Okay. So. Um, so page 45, this is in the new chapter for dispensaries, um, again, under once they shift over. And this is language uh, with regard to the dispensaries and, uh, and information uh, not being accessible relating to uh, security, transportation, public safety, trade secrets, and employees uh, that are contained in an application for Tell license. Tell me what section you're on, and I'll try to follow who the bill is introduced. Well, no, no I'm, the I'm using mine. Yeah, I, I've gone through this so many times that oh. I know it by heart. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're on page 45 at the bottom of the page, yep. section B, and the, again, this is language that came over that I've already talked to you about, but I just want to show it's in your amendment now. This came over from GovOps, and this yep. was the, the, the PRA exemption with regard to certain information with regard to the dispensaries, and again, kind of just modeling what they do currently under the uh, with, with Department of Public Safety. Next thing is I'm not going to, you can see the places where I change it to from children to persons of, under the age of 21, but I don't think I need to talk about those. Uh, <coughs> next up to change is bottom of page 49, and this is on criminal background checks for, um, for applicants for, um, for a dispensary license. And again, this is language that we talked about earlier, because in a few different places around when the board is adopting rules for determining whether an applicant should be granted a dispensary license and do the background check, um, they're, the board's going to be adopting a system you know, whether they go through and determine points for certain offenses, like some states have done, or um, whatever their process is for determining whether or not somebody's criminal history record to disqualify them for a dispensary application. And you see the language starting on the bottom of the page on line 21 that's based on factors that demonstrate whether the applicant presently poses a threat to public safety or the proper function of the regulated market. That language also you see in the next <coughs> section on page 50, starting on line four, uh, 13, and that has to do with the dispensary identification card. So if you work in a dispensary, again, just like now, you have to have a card, Same. you get a background check, and you have like an ID card that they have. Next changes are to the tax section, so page 53 and section 7902. So uh, I think you guys have already discussed this a, a bit um, in both Seneca Ops and in here about changing. It was a 1% little option, and then uh, I think you discussed about it being 2 in here, and then Seneca Ops said they'd like it to be, to say, like, essentially up to 2, so it could be less than 2, so it shall not exceed 2. And then the language that struck in subdivision B1, this is just relating back to the local government authority about what they can regulate. And it just, it, the way that it was originally drafted kind of made it sound as though they, you know, somebody wanted to make the argument, despite all you're saying that you can't do these things um, over here, it, it just sounded like maybe they possibly could prohibit the retail sale through something other than a vote. And so this is just kind of a clarification language. It doesn't change anything substantively. I just think it was it was uh, probably kind of awkwardly written initially. Can you just remind me, so at this, should this pass, then a municipality would be able to totally ban 
a shop by a vote of the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's contained in the earlier sections. Yeah. This is just a cross reference, but this references um, the reference there is referencing some other things having to do with um, their inherent authority under Title 24 around nuisance and things like that. And by referencing it, we don't want to give the impression that they could somehow completely prohibit it through using a nuisance ordinance, which is what you guys have prohibited earlier. It's kind of like if you if you want to, to ban it, you have to do it through the process that you set forth. That's it. All right. So, good job. I wish I, I will find my copy of this. Well, I have a new so one for you. Very the soon. The problem is, quite frankly, that uh, we're all in a rush here. We've got thousands of things going on, and we don't have the staffing. We don't have the, you know, I, the it just, uh, you know, people expect out of this legislature things that cannot be delivered because of the constraints of the legislature's budgets. Um, it's unfortunate. Peggy does her best to keep us track of us all, but I decided to keep my own cannabis file, and here's what's happened. And that's part of the problem here. We just do not have it. People expect more from us than we're able to deliver. And particularly this year, the unfortunate thing, Michelle, for Senator White and I were talking about it earlier, and I'm sure the other members of the committee of Walter have all dealt with it. For whatever reason, this year has been a difficult year for the staff to try to handle the, the number of drafting requests, and then we have House committees tying up staff for three, four days in a row. So our committees can't get them. Uh, this needs to change, or this legislature won't be able to function. And I understand, you know, House members, they go for drafting requests on a first come, first served basis. But if you have a bill, like the Youth Justice Bill, that you're trying to work with a list of stakeholders before you introduce the bill, I still haven't even signed it out yet because mm -hmm. Brent has been working with the stakeholders and they're trying to get to agreement on a number of issues. And I've gone over it three or four times and there's one sticking point. So, and then that gets held up because the proofers are doing some bill that will never even see the light of day. So there, that's my rant for the day. Um, so <laughs> thank you staff for doing what you do, Peggy, mm -hmm. Michelle, and any other staff members. This place is is dysfunctional right now in terms of trying to do legislation. Um, we're working from drafts. We've never done that before. Yesterday we worked from the draft on bills. Never have done that before. So that's my and, uh, I'm talking. It's where you have record number and it keeps increasing. Well, it's not only that, but the system says first come, first served. And when you have something that is a must-pass bill or close to it, for whatever reason, because obviously it wasn't first, it gets backed up because you're trying to get agreement before you introduce it. <coughs> So I'm sure that's going on in every committee, and, and you know we're going to have you know, some problems this year that we haven't confronted in the past, and when they come up, we're going to be surprised. Well, so anyway, that I will the mention since you brought it up that so I haven't um, had any of these amendments approved just because there's not the capacity down there. So, but what I'm going to do is I, I've already gotten almost all the amendment based on your last walkthrough done. I'll make any little tweaks here. I'm ready to come back like so as soon as like 30 minutes next, with you. So, but, yeah. so you can talk about it, vote on it, but um, the next, it won't be it won't be proved until later. Well, but the next decision that has to be made is whether or not to include the uh, a special exemption or whatever you want to call it for the medical dispensaries to be able to start up earlier than the others and you know it, I think we've already talked about it. Um, is there a motion to add that to the bill? Yeah. 
I make a motion to add it to the bill. Okay, Senator <clears throat> Mitka is that made a motion to add the early start up to the medical dispensaries to the bill. Um, is there a discussion? I realized that I was um, put in the position of potentially being the decider. The decider. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I and I still go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But where I think I've landed is that I I I don't have an issue with a monopoly. I don't have an issue with um, an equal playing field because we know that there's probably no nothing that we can do to make it truly an equal playing field. But, and I appreciate the fact that the <coughs> dispensaries were willing to take the risk when they did and have put in a lot of effort and a lot of infrastructure and capital into it. I do <coughs> think that there are issues around it. Um, they have an entirely different structure. They're vertically integrated. These are not vertically integrated. The rules will be different, and I'm, I'm, up, and I heard from um, some patients that they don't want to um, go to the same place that um, buy their medicine that somebody would be going. And I realize it would be different door or different whatever. So I believe I've come down on the side of not. And I'm, and I am uh, sorry that I'm. Because I really thought that it might be a, it, and if we're doing it just for the money, I don't think that that's that's a reason to do it. That's so. a good point. Um, but I, I, you know, <clears throat> it's a sort of debatable issue, and, it's, and knowing that it's in the House bill, it may come back at us. I, I haven't changed my mind. And the cultivators are, uh, the permits for the cultivators are much earlier than the cultivators for the retailers, so that a dispensary could apply to be a cultivator earlier it's than a, It's a also retailer. a decision that could be revisited next year. Yeah. yeah. Senator Benning, you are not the great decider. <clears throat> I'm not the great decider. I didn't have I to make I was already my planning speech. on exercising my Republican prerogative of being able to change my mind. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I listened to the debate amongst several of us the other day, and I thought Dick had more credible points to his argument at that point, so that's where I'm coming from. So now I can't be associated so with Bush, but you are. I would are. say to that. We're not going to add that. So I would like to say that I read someplace that um, I wanted that because it would be faster. Right. Hardly the case. I wanted it because it would be, I think, a smoother rollout. And the money isn't the issue. I, mm -hmm. just, I want it yeah. to be, if we have this, I want it to be <coughs> work well in communities. I think the opportunity for it, as you said, if it was for five, to get it going and have it be smooth rather than kind of the potential chaos that might happen when the rollout occurs and it's not handled uh, in a way yeah. that is respected. I hope we'll learn from Massachusetts mistakes on the rollout. It clearly um, has been helpful for me to be able to read the Boston Globe's articles mm -hmm. every day, and I've tried to share many of them with you. And, you know, the fact that the entire city of Boston, which is obviously larger in population than the state of Vermont, only has nine licenses. <laughs> Makes you wonder what would happen if we granted 10 early. Yeah. Uh, what, where the competition might be. But also, you know, Massachusetts has had an ex a long roll out there. Cannabis Commission is still developing rules and things come up and then they have to do a rule for that. And, you know, it's the, the, the other issue, one other issue that we kind of glossed over was delivery, by the way. Have we added delivery? I don't think or have we asked the board to look at it with the other things that you have put in to ask the board to look at? I don't think that delivery Do you remember there was a discussion here about delivery mm -hmm. because okay. it's clear that the those that are growing and giving 
are delivering, and even some that might be selling are delivering. Um, and whether the board should consider that when you've got your list, that's the one other issue that I thought we didn't really. We had a list of things the board would consider. Remember, we discussed that? Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, yes, I have that. And it's, uh, I took off the cafe lounge stuff right. for the next person. So the only things you have them coming back on are kind of like the year two rollouts right. and, uh, and how to work with other agencies. Uh, that's part of the year one rollout. Oh, okay. There's one other thing, sorry. There's the medical deliveries. Yeah, they deliver, so yeah. we don't want to interfere with that. Well, they could, they could still. I don't think we had here. No, I don't remember. General. I thought y'all had decided in the no. bills introduced it said no delivery for yeah. retail. Well, but I'll leave it that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, 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 I thought can <laughs> deliver or can't. Well, under this, there would be no provision that would allow delivery. Then I can add on. something if you want the board to come back with recommendation, a proposal, or you need to. Aggressive. I, I think that uh, whether we do or don't, it's it's going to pop up as an issue because the attorney general has tried to quash the gifting thing, but delivery will fill gaps. <coughs> I think it might not be a bad idea. I think we we bogged down a little last time over whether it would be a recommendation um, because that seems to lean in the direction of doing it. But if we have the board consider the issue of looking at other states. Yeah. Agree. Okay. I'm fine with that. Are there any other issues that we've missed before the cell rewrites? Did you want to talk about the Abenaki issue here in the uh, I agreed with Senator uh, White committee, um, but maybe other members of the committee would not agree. I think it wasn't my committee, it was me. Oh. <laughs> Okay. All right. Then maybe we, didn't you even, should. we didn't even have that discussion. Okay. Uh, I mean, that was well, part why don't of you, um, I, I, I think that um, it's on page 30 of this, and my recommendation is not to put to reference at all on line two, and it, to just um, put a period after Vermont. And I believe that. Um, Members of the Abnaki community would be um, covered under lines 10 and 11. And to single them out to give preference is, I don't think, makes sense. I oppose that. I agree, and I, I think they're also covered under the minority ownership um, mm -hmm. provision of yeah. health care. Well, that was something I saw as being a frightening. Frightening the week. Yeah. It being something that would recognize particularly their status as an unrecognized federal tribe, but as a recognized by Vermont government. But I'm, I you know, think to me that, you know, there's, you're correct, they are, would be seen as a minority group. Um, but oftentimes it seems like when, even when I was looking at the, the, uh, the racial bias bill that just passed the, uh, the Senate Education Committee, there's references to various groups, but it seems like Native Americans get left out of, of these sure. groups that have been discriminated against. Well, or I, am I wrong about uh, this? I would say we had testimony from uh, from an Abenaki chief who um, voiced similar concerns, and we had assurances in the committee that the definition of ethnic group that's there includes in two ways, the, the <coughs> but it, it, but and that's true. Um, you mean in terms the of the proposal from name from the attorney general as well? There was nothing that I talked about. If, if that's uh, I, I think during the racial bias discussion, we should talk a little bit more about this because if if I just feel like we our discussions frequently center upon people of color or um, sexual orientation or disability and I you know it, it seems like they get left out as people of color um, I, I just you know I'm sensitive to it because I remember having uh, a couple of kids in my program who were having that and it was very difficult for them 
to, they have a whole different system in terms of the federal foster care system. <coughs> and there are other rules for Native Ameri Americans. <coughs> Anyhow, I'm fine with not having it in here, but I think we should be conscious of that yep. and be discussed. Um, I think we're going to have testimony from the same person that you probably heard from. Yeah. So I don't know if we talked about this or not, but under the priorities, and I think it's, in, in my mind, it's just for cultivators, but, and so I don't know how you put that in because there are no priorities for the different things, but I, I would like to see priorities for cultivators given to small local growers and also uh, to people who, and I don't know how to say this, who have experience in horticulture, science, agriculture, something, um, trying to get at the people who are currently doing it, uh, that they should be given some priority in the, and I don't know how we put that in there. Um, so the idea being that illegal growers are, are brought in. Yeah. What well, if you just said, can somebody help me with what is small? But they shouldn't have, be having experience in cannabis cultivation because there's, it, that's been illegal. You know what, it's been one of the issues when I was asked on, on uh, BPR, and in other places, what is small? And I guess it's something that's in the eye of the beholder. I, I kind of responded, something that's small enough to still be profitable if the person is able to provide a secure seed to sale type of operation, then, then that would be, that could be as small as they could do it, but it has to be secure, blah, blah, blah. And I'm wondering if we've ever defined small. Well, we have special, um, we have a section in here that gives special, that they can establish special rules for people who are under 500 square feet. And my, I guess my, my concern is that there are a lot of people out there who aren't, this isn't going to be their only um, in, endeavor. They're going to, there are farmers out there who are, it, it, it's, uh, currently and could or could be a supplemental income for them and they so th that is a, their their business plan wouldn't have them supporting themselves entirely by this but I think they should be given some preference to to um, in granting the permits for the cultivators but the problem is you still need to have a secure facility. Yeah, right? and they can, and they'll, they'll do special. Um, and it needs to be, um, you know, if they have to go through certain regulations that they wouldn't have to go through for other products. I remember having a conversation when this was maybe three or four years ago, the first time we did this bill in economic development, we had testimony from a couple of small, you know, black market growers and we talked to them about would they be willing to accept certain you know security uh, things and those people were resistant at that point to the idea that they they said they would continue to grow as they are now because they didn't yeah. want to go through the whole system. So I don't know how they also don't have to pay taxes. Right. I don't know how you cut into that. Well, there is a section in here, and I cannot find it ever when I'm looking for it, that says that they should consider um, slightly different regulations for people. Those are under, yeah, under the rule section, but my question, I guess, for you is, is because is I, I think it's mixing a few different issues, mm -hmm. which is, um, is it that you want, so remember, the board is going to be establishing the, the tiers for the, right. the cultivation determining, and so they may say we're going to mm -hmm have an unlimited number of 500 and under licenses where we're going to uh, you know, have large amounts. And so what Senator Sears says is, well, what is small? I think I mentioned here that when I was looking at comparing with other states, Vermont, what you had in 241 as the largest grow, facility, grow operation that you would have allowed under 241 was the second smallest that Mass is doing. You know, so it's all in you know, whatever, however you decide to do it. And so the board's gonna develop those tiers and determine how many permits are available under that. If you want, or if you want illegal growers to come in, I mean, there's, a, well, let's say, there's like the illegal grower issue, then there's like the small, separate and apart. If you want the board to say, I want priority for small growers, and you can, then I wouldn't do it in priorities. I would say it separately and say, when the board is in, 
issuing cultivator licenses, it shall prioritize issuance of you know, tiers, oh, okay. smaller tiers, or something yeah. along those lines. Right. I would go that direction. Okay. The issue, uh, then you had mentioned before about you wanted, uh, you know, on priorities that if it's a cultivator license for people to have experience running. But I think you know that's going to be something that they're developing the yeah. rules and doing. In terms of like, yeah. if you're doing it illegally now and you're going to get, you're going to get, you know, the VIP pass to the front. I'm honestly, I'm not. Clear about yeah. how to write that. Yeah. No, okay. I'm but, I, but if you'll do the small, if you'll put some language in there about the small, right? That that, that satisfies. But me. I but I do want to recognize yes. that I understand that it is that it is a, a policy decision that you know a large part. This bill is in many different places intended to bring people from the illegal market into the regulated market, and that's a goal of this in order to kind of you know, minimize the illegal market as much as possible. Yeah. Um, but so I, I get it, but I'm it, it, from a drafting standpoint, I'm a little stumped on. Well, will you say it all right now? This is the so called strict liability medical monitoring bill. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity. And, and um, I don't know if you could give me a minute just to amend my testimony to add in your last point there. Anything that might help us in our arguments? <laughs> <laughs> the anti. <laughs> We would object to that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, William Driscoll with Associated Industries of Vermont. I appreciate the, the time you're providing for some additional testimony. I understand that the committee's time is somewhat tight, so I'll try to be brief here. But, um, and talk mostly about what like our recommendations would be uh, for you at this point. Clearly, as we testified in the past that it should be no surprise. We share the concerns that were raised about the uh, impact on costs and availability of insurance, uncertainty of operational costs and liabilities, and the other issues that have driven a lot of concern about the legislation. Um, but with regard to making uh, some recommendations uh, for the committee's consideration, uh, what I try to do is look at um, look at how this legislation has evolved at different points, including last year's. Uh, version, uh, some of the recommendations that other witnesses have put forward, and also with regard to trying to find some <coughs> common ground on the uh, monitoring uh, provisions, looking more closely at what some of the other states that have gone down this path before, what kind of provisions they seem to be laying out that maybe address some of the concerns that we've, that we've had. So I'll try to go through all of that at this point. Um, first of all, and, and obviously it's a big ask, but uh, we would recommend uh, deleting the strict liability provisions from the bill, separating that question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to be honest, it's hard for us to come up with ways to try to massage that language that doesn't still leave all the concerns we have. That was the path that this legislation took last year uh, in terms of separating the questions for you know, different different areas of, of further consideration. Um, and we would certainly recommend that this legislation follow a similar path as that. Um, beyond that, we have made a recommendation in the past that it might be better to look at maybe addressing some of the uh, remedies or recourses in 6615 of, of uh, Title X, where you have the state response to the releases. Uh, some of the kind of damages or concerns that people seem to address in those sections of this bill can maybe be addressed in some way in that, in that area of the law. So our second recommendation is to um, this one you've, you've certainly heard before, including on, on, on in this in this go around, but to go ahead and exclude uh, permitted releases that are in compliance with statutory and regulatory requirements um, from, the, from the liability provisions of the bill. Um, you know, it's been raised that that's not always a defense of the context, but that doesn't mean that it's not a reasonable uh, defense or criteria in this context. Um, we think that that certainly speaks to the question of whether a company is acting neg negligently or, resp or irresponsibly, um, and also this sort of predictability and, and confidence that both companies and um, their insurers or, or other or financiers or others um, have in, in the did environment. That, would, if we were to do that, mm -hmm. would that, that would actually hurt efforts to hold somebody accountable who had created um, under current law mm -hmm. 
created a toxic uh, environment. I'm, I'm thinking specifically of St. Gobain who have accepted responsibility for polluting, even though it's questionable if the permits were there when they did it. Um, this would exclude them from that because if they had the permits, uh, this would be dramatic change, I would think. And maybe I'm reading more into it, and I wish Mike was here, but I'm thinking that this would actually give more protection to the polluter than is currently available. <coughs> Well, I mean, that's certainly a, a fair concern. Maybe I'm wrong. I, yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to be wrong on it. I hope I am. Well, I have the disadvantage or advantage of also not being a lawyer. So yeah. uh, I don't think what we would recommend is taking away recourses that currently exist. <coughs> but to the extent that this legislation changes criteria or perhaps uh, increases uh, exposure to liability, that that be focused on. Well, I, I would. I'm not committed to that. I don't, I, you know, I'm not, I just would, that would be one question that I would request that. Somebody who uh, looks at this, either Mike or Brady or somebody else, to explain to make sure that if we were to accept this, we wouldn't be going backwards. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Bill a question about yeah, that. Sure. But in that definition, you would leave intentional or unintentional. But could you agree? Right. So, an, an, so an unintentional violation of a permit would be covered. And it's like, I mean, yeah. And you know, if we move on that, maybe we'd like to massage that further, but yeah. the, the, third, the, core, the core recommendation would be yeah. the yeah. The third point, um, how would that hurt you guys? That's my favorite of what I was just about to Yeah, the one that's your de definition. Right, so our concern with that is that um, that's it's, the it's, it's, Yes, right. And it just seems uh, unnecessarily and, and, and so broad. Um, you know, showing by extra testimony to increase, simply increasing the risk of development of the latent disease. That gets back to the question of whether the coffee in your cup or the cream in your coffee or the sugar in your coffee is so it's going to be um, encapsulated or captured by the scope of the legislation. And our view is that if you look at the other definitions that are in there, in terms of the list they're on, where there's a, there's a health determination by the Department of Health, if you look at all those other uh, categories that, that capture what a, what a covered top chemical would be, this seems you know very comprehensive and, and sufficient in our view. Um, the alternative would be to incorporate within this provision all sorts of criteria about you know the scientific that, standards. That provision was added after the bill, I believe. But it was not in the original. Uh, there were there, there have been there have been varying versions that I have or don't have that. That's, that's true. Okay. The, the main concern is it's so broad that it would bring in right as it's currently what is harmed right. Right. Um, um, we found that some was harmful. <laughs> I don't know which who you'd sue for that one, but um, yeah. I'm trying to figure it out because it's harmed me greatly. <laughs> Maybe my mother who didn't tell me to wear sunscreen. Um, so our next group, and this is where we're, now we're getting into uh, from the, the the amendment that we got on Tuesday. I'll just follow that yeah. on page eight. Um, so the first one addresses the first, uh, the first criteria, and we would, certainly the movement to tortious conduct is I think was a step um, forward from what the, what the original language was. We think it would be more clear uh, and appropriate to be more specific about uh, requiring negligence or reckless conduct. Um, if you look at the states that have court precedents establishing medical liability, it appears that most of them have negligence as the standard. Um, and we think that that would be a more appropriate way uh, to look at it. This precise formulation I just took from the testimony that Global Foundry suggested, which seems to be a reasonable formulation. Obviously, there are others. Um, if you look at those court decisions, sometimes just negligence or like okay, yes, one guy. Um, but we would recommend, recommend uh, that change. Um, the next one again is this issue that has come up is requiring exposure to exceed background levels. And I, I would also suggest the consideration of looking at um, actual state and federal health guidelines. Because these responsible authorities have looked at how much of an exposure is, is of concern. And that would seem to be relevant to, uh, to, this, to this topic. Um, again, certainly background, above background level exposure is something that other states have looked at. Um, again, Pennsylvania, and when I speak of Pennsylvania, the source I was using was the 
um, decision on the motion to compel that I think was put on, into your record on Tuesday. I'm not getting a chance to, to read through it. Um, but it included a list of some of the criteria in Pennsylvania that seemed, that seemed um, I think Pennsylvania gets referenced fairly commonly and, and a lot of the language seemed to be, um, make sense for, for what we're trying to, to offer here. Um, the, finally, again, this is, again, speaks to um, sort of the level of, um, so the level of, of harm and criteria rather than being too open-ended. Um, that's to require as a proximate result of the exposure that the person has a significantly increased risk of contracting a serious life disease. Uh, again, that's, that's from the Pennsylvania uh, description. Um, the current language in here, um, number three, is simply just any increase in risk, which is, again seems too much of a de minimis threshold to really have a, a significant meaning. Uh, and there's also the, you know, the concern and controversy over uh, whether there doesn't even have to be a certainty or likelihood of, of contracting the disease. It seems like language like this in other, from other states would have a more reasonable bar to, to me, uh, maybe more appropriate in that sense. Um, also similarly, in terms of uh, having criteria for, for the need of the monitoring, um, again, this is, this is combined from two two of the provisions from the Pennsylvania descriptions, um, which is that rather than simply having having any any physician uh, uh, prescribe monitoring without any sort of standards associated with that, um, to instead say that you know, the prescribed monitoring regime is different than that normally recommended in the absence of the exposure and that the monitoring regime is reasonably necessary according to contemporary scientific principles. Again, obviously something like that can be really uh, two different ways. I simply borrowed the, the wording from, from that uh, Pennsylvania overview. Um, and then the last point, again, this has come up, and, and I apologize, I haven't been here when the committee has discussed this in, in every every time that it has arisen, but there has been the question again of is this going to be retroactive or, or isn't it? And um, I you know a number of folks concerned with the legislation have, have been interested in, in making sure that it's not retroactive so as to provide greater clarity going forward as opposed to uncertainty and risk uh, looking backwards. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about it. I would we would recommend that um, if if it's the interest of the committee to have it not be retroactive just to be explicit about that in the legislation to avoid the yeah. argument in the I have a question about retroactivity that would need to be answered. Mm -hmm. That is um, I'm fine if we wanted to exempt something that's already in a court system, mm -hmm. like the St. Louis case. It's already a files, there's already files, that's a female, and there's already court files. But what about a product that was used 10 years ago that we now find has impacted the groundwater? That would mean we couldn't go after it because it happened 10 years ago. It's like there's, you know, it's like looking at a statute of limitations and having a zero statute of limitations. So I would, I would be more concerned about things that are that we haven't discovered yet. Mm -hmm. um, I could see us saying, well, it's already in the court system. The courts are already dealing with it under current law. This could actually confuse things, I suppose. But um, I, I just, I, I don't know how I. Would, Say well, I have no. I, you know, we found out that um, another chemical company had um, exposed Vermonters to some serious um, health risks. Then we would be exempting them because we said it wasn't retroactive. Mm -hmm. and it would be only future spills, mm -hmm. future contaminations. Yeah, and then that would be my concern. There, I I understand where you're going. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Of course, I didn't have, uh, wasn't able to find time to dig it up. I know there was some legislation, not some legislation, some language discussed um, on the House side. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if that's, if that's a good or a bad selling point in the Senate committee, but uh, I tried to, I tried to address that question of how do you address retroactivity. It, didn't, it did not make it into the final version that that um, went through the process, but we could try to dig that up and see if, if there's time. I'm sure, 
That's the number of children. I'm sure it's George Eddie other children. Yeah, I'm sure it's George Eddie other Any other questions for Phil? Um, I do have one question about the reports. Number five. I the background levels. Yeah, I thought we did that. Um, I mean, at the background. Yeah, I thought it was. I mean, I didn't think, think it was. The, sense that the background level was not. I mean, even in Bennington, or I have a constituent who's arguing with me because his well tested is zero, and. <laughs> Which said, you know, I'm sorry that you don't have toxic, you know, waste on your well. Um, and we don't know why it tested at zero, but keep testing. But, you know, there is no contamination, so really you're not eligible for the, the poet system and the other things that were provided. It was really kind of a, a humorous, but it was odd because he wanted to be contaminated. So, um, <laughs> so I, I wonder if that isn't already there. I know it's popped up in and out of versions going I mean, on. I, I, I don't have any problem saying if you're, yeah. if you're not contaminated under the background levels that have been established by the state. I, I don't think it's in the draft that the draft that you got Tuesday. Um, no. and, also, and also, I do want to make it clear that, you know, Exposure above background levels, you can find that in other states. I don't know if there are other states that address um, state and federal health guidelines. That's that's just our recommendation. It's not in the bill right now, exposure above background levels. Right. A, no, it would be the exposure is above, yeah, the background level is, I think it's actually the other way. <laughs> there isn't enough of the contamination in your. Um, Right, it says the, the exposure increases the risk of developing the latent disease. Right, so to, if it was below the background level, if the, let's say there were a number of wells that post that were below 20 parts per trillion, or a million, trillion, that several wells below 20 parts per trillion, those weren't considered to be in the major level. Um, and, they, and there was uh, retesting of them because some of them that <coughs> below that level were actually uh, near wells that tested high above. So there's no, you know, shallower wells might test lower. Um, deeper wells may test lower. And it's hard to tell how the, the PFOAs went through the, the groundwater. But so. Right, so your point is you're. You're already there. You're, because the background level was, was then right. you're exposed. That exposure right. increases your risk. But if your exposure was over 20, then you are considered to be in a risky population. And do we, I mean, in that case, do we know what the background level was before? I mean, 20. like in, when, in our case with Vermont Yankee, oh, yeah. we know that there is a certain background level of radioactivity in in the air and in the ground and in our bodies but so if your exposure is above that that level then it's considered exposure but if it's if it's at that level and it won't be fact dependent just you know i think yankee's a good example of because radio uh, you know radioactivity can come from multiple sources yeah. you know that exposure increased your your risk of, of developing the, the if, if you were found to be above that background level. But um, I, I'm, I, I don't know, I hear more comments, but it does seem to me that if you're, that there should be an exposure above a background level in order to I think that that's, harm. that's a policy decision for the committee if they want to keep with that language. Um, any other questions? Um, those are our those are our key recommendations. Thank you. I just want to listen to your talk. I could go along with that. Appreciate it. The final witness. Thank you. Thank you. Is uh, uh, 
Ken Rumbelt. Always stumble on your last name, Ken. Ken. Sorry. Uh, he was an attorney for Vermont Law School. And, uh, they had some comments about some of the recommendations, and they have some further recommendations to present. Well, first of all, I'd like to share that everybody does have to do my last name, which is why my wife did not decide to take my last name. <laughs> she did not want to be called Mrs. Rumlet for the rest of her life. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll take um, a stab at addressing some of the comments that uh, Mr. Driscoll just made. Um, <clears throat> And I think I want to start off with the background levels issue, because that is, I think, fresh on everybody's mind. The key issue in any claim for medical monitoring is what has happened to you as a result of exposure to the defendant's chemicals. Right? So in order to prove that, you need to prove that a defendant caused you to be exposed to a certain concentration of chemicals. In, in whether or not monitoring is required in that scenario doesn't depend on existing background levels. The question is whether that contribution is sufficient to warrant the need for medical monitoring. Does that make sense? No. No. It does to me. Oh, it, so, it doesn't to me because if you already have a, I mean, I, I'm not, as, as familiar with the PFOA issue, but I am very familiar with the Vermont Yankee well, issue. Should use radioactivity. If, if I have that level of radioactivity, and, and then that's the <coughs> background level, how can I claim that exposure to Vermont Yankee has? Right. Let's say the threshold <coughs> for um, the need for monitoring is 20. And there's a background level of five. If you're in, in monitoring is only again required if or recommended if you have an exposure of twenty. Well I, I don't understand that because it doesn't say that. Is that what it says here? That they, we can establish the level for <coughs> monitoring? Let me, let me try to <coughs> an expert will come in and testify that above a threshold exposure of, say, 20, whatever units those are, monitoring is recommended. Oh. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. And let's say there's a background level of five, assuming we all agree on what the term background level is, which is another story. In, so therefore, in order to get monitoring under a medical monitoring claim, you would need to prove that the defendant is responsible for an exposure of 20. I, I get that, and that is, so it would always be above whatever would be considered the... But I think that goes back to the second criteria. There is a probable link between okay. exposure to the toxic substance and the latent disease. Okay. And so if the exposure is based on the background level, if you have what... Mr. Romo, the, the scenario, Mr. Romo. Okay. Right. Now, there's also the situation where there is some background exposure, say five again, and the defendant is responsible for 15, and the plaintiff can prove that. Well, the question then is is there a contribution to the plaintiff's exposure that puts them at that level, something that they should be responsible for in part? And I, I think the answer to that is yes. If you send somebody over the edge, um, then um, liability can attach. Now, the other issue with background levels is there will be um, a large debate over what background means and how to calculate it. Mm -hmm. With something like PFOA, which is not a natural chemical, what should the background be? Zero. I, I think that's pretty plain to see. There's other types of substances for which, like radiation, there might be some background levels that aren't attributable to um, um, you know, anthropogenic sources. Okay. But why get into that debate? Right. The question is whether your exposure that's a result of the defendant's conduct is enough 
to put you in a situation where monitoring is recommended and required. Yeah, I get that. What, what about the issue of, um, some have suggested, are we done with the background? I am. <clears throat> um, some have suggested that there be a, a level of the, of the toxic discharge and be by gallons or whatever the method is. Is that problematic in determining how many, you know, I only spilled 50 gallons versus 1,000 gallons? Well, I, I would recommend, and I, I think you were speaking to the scope of defendants who might fall under the medical monitoring or the strict liability condition. Yeah. Um, we have now exposure. Right. You know, if, you were, if you expose the population to it. In, in my view, the issue is whether whatever was released is enough to cause harm in, or, or necessary or, or requires monitoring as a result of exposure. Um, in order, I understand there's a concern over not bringing in mom and pop businesses right. into the realm of strict liability or medical monitoring, and I think that's a fair concern. I would not, I would not add um, a requirement based on the amount of any particular chemical. Rather, look at the capability of the um, business or industry to address the risks. Um, and I think a good indicator of that is the number of employees either at a particular facility or corporate-wide. That's in the bill now, okay. or in the draft that you're looking at. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to add one more thing. I think you know, if you have this issue of having to determine how much of a particular chemical is on site, there will be debates over do you need active ingredient, do you need a mixture, and it overly complicates a situation that really isn't about regulation, right? This isn't requiring somebody to do or refrain from doing anything, file reports, um, hire somebody to look at, um, you know, complying with OSHA or EPRA, other regulations. The issue is just who, who should, um, who has the level of sophistication to understand the, the, the seriousness of using toxic chemicals and releasing them into the environment. I believe that's the concern. Mm -hmm. um, there was testimony about excluding from strict liability um, releases that are permitted um, under a current permit or future permit. In, I think we have to go back and look at why we're here in the first place. We're here in the first place because the law and the regulations were not sufficiently protective for Vermonters. It, the, there were releases of a chemical that was not regulated, still isn't regulated, you know, nationally, certainly. Um, and as a result of that, people are in a bad situation. So to the extent that there's a desire to um, exclude and carve out permitted releases, that ignores the entire problem and I think eliminates the safety net, which is why this legislation was being proposed in the first place. The other thing I've mentioned is that... I want to dwell on that for a minute because I think that there's been a lot of misunderstanding about the goal of the bill. And it is because the law is, is not adequate <coughs> currently to protect the monitors. And uh, I realize the industry's concerned. I realize the insurance industry's concerned. I realize nobody wants to be held responsible for something that um, happened and the industry would rather have the taxpayer or the victim pay but I have found no other system in this nation 
that holds the victim accountable for the damages done by the perpetrator. We deal with criminal law all the time here. I mean, it would be absurd to put the victim in jail rather than the perpetrator of an aggravated sexual assault. That's my rant for that one. You had your rant for the day before. No, it's the second rant of the day. This is, it started out as a bad day all around. Um, but I, I thank you for raising that point. Because I really think that's something that's been missing, at least in the conversation. Why would we do this in the first place? And that's a nice segue into what I wanted to say next, which is that for it, it seems odd to me to request an exemption for permitted releases under strict liability if you truly believed those um, permitted levels were protective and, and safe. I, I think it comes with an understanding that they're not or that there's certainly a, a significant risk that those, um, those standards aren't protected. So I, I find that a little conflicting in my personal view. Um, yeah. So I just am not sure. So you're saying the standards set by the state, for example, mm -hmm. are not safe? I'm saying that there's a possibility, certainly, that they're not safe. And if there was 100% confidence that those levels would be protected for now and forever, and that in the setting of those standards, there was only concern over risk to human health and the environment. And, and on that basis, those, stand, those standards were set, which is not the case all the time. Certainly not under um, you know, statutes that require a look at um, the economic impact of regulations. Then it would be more palatable, in my view, to say we should carve these these um, permanent releases out. But we know that's not the case. We know that there is no, um, I think, perfectly protective standard. No, one hundred percent. There's no one hundred percent, and maybe not even maybe less than that. I mean, we've seen certainly in the case of PFOA that industry had knowledge of. Um, the impacts of the chemical on human health, and that was kept from the public, kept from regulators. And as a result, for many, many years, and still today, it's not a regulated chemical at the national level. The national. And, and I think Vermont is now working towards regulations, but you know, this is already four or five years after discovery of PFOA issues in Bennington. So in another setting uh, last night, I heard from our the chair of our natural resources, and he, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but there are something like 5,000 PFAs or PFs, whatever they're called, and um, it went from five that had some definition, I believe he said we're now up to about 60, but 60 out of 5,000 or whatever that number is, is not. I, I, so you're right, we're, the, we're way, way, way behind. In we are way behind, and that the standard for a class of chemicals for, for regulation is absolute proof of harm, we're not going to know. And, right. and you know, ultimately, it, it, means, and it means that Vermonters are guinea pigs. Right. And everybody else in the And everybody else. <laughs> that's right. So moving right along. Um, there was concern over the language in the bill about um, the standard for uh, medical monitoring with respect to an increased risk of harm. Mm -hmm. uh, the concern was that it's overly broad and there should be additional qualifiers um, on that issue. Um, and, and I would say one, when you incorporate language, which is in some other states. That's on page 7, line 15 and 16 of the bill. Right. I think this is one of those issues that we could argue all day about, so I've heard Mr. Driscoll's position. Um, whenever you add a qualifier like significant 
um, what you're doing is inviting litigation over what that term means. And I think the real question is whether when taken as a whole, you look at all the elements that a plaintiff would need to prove in order to get monitoring and the difficulty in proving those, that there, there's an understanding that we're not talking about situations where you drink a cup of coffee and you see the coffee company. That's, that's kind of an absurd read of how this would work. Mm -hmm. Because there's other provisions about who can be held liable. There's provisions that require a release from a certain type of facility. Um, there's provisions that say that the exposure, that testing is reasonably necessary um, for the exposure and there's a definition of that. So I would caution the use of any of these qualifying words that are just going to invite litigation when taken as a whole the statute would address those concerns. And on top of that, and we've, we've spoken about this before, and I know there's been testimony about it, these are not easy claims. It requires a tremendous amount, tremendous amount of resource. They're also very much population-based claims. This isn't someone going to see a doctor. This is a whole community that's been exposed. And that's traditionally where medical monitoring claims have been brought. Not so again, I would just caution against those kinds of, I, mean, I like to call them measle words, entering into, the, entering into the statute. There was testimony about um, defining tortious conduct more specifically. And I, I'm not sure exactly where the issue is. What, I know there's probably a desire to limit what kind of conduct um, could trigger medical monitoring. Um, I would say, at a minimum, you would want to include, if it's further defined, negligence, surely reckless conduct would be a sub, would be um, one um, that you could include. Um, but also, the common law torts of trespass and nuisance. Those are often included in these kinds of claims where there's been a release of a hazardous substance into the environment. And I, I really think that, at least my memory is that, the, the issues over whether strict liability would apply here. And that's, of course, a decision that um, this body can make. <coughs> there was testimony that the medical monitoring um, language should require testing that is um, different than normally recommended um, in, in accordance with contemporaneous scientific principles. I, I go back to what is it that we are dealing with here. It's very similar to the background level of exposure issue that we talked about earlier. Different than normally recommended? Well, the question is whether the defendants caused an exposure and as a result, this person is required to have some kind of testing um, in order to, to uh, find that, uh, or sorry, detect that latent disease as early as possible. And that's it. Why look at whether in the absence um, of exposure, what they would be required to look at? The question is, did this conduct necessitate testing? And if so, should a person, should a defendant be held liable for it? Otherwise, we're going to get into issues of, well, what's your medical history? What are you normally tested for? What is anybody normally tested for? And that, I think, would open people up to having their irrelevant medical records become part of the case and prolonging the litigation substantially. So there's a risk there. And then finally, the issue of retroactivity. Um, my understanding of Vermont law is that a statute is not retroactive unless it expressly says so. So the language has to be explicit. And that's just a decision, um, again. What about a, even Michael or yourself? If 
can we distinguish between those things we don't know? I'm going to sound like the whole one stuff. The known unknowns. The known unknowns. I mean, we know there has been pollution, but we haven't identified it yet, so we don't know what we don't know. And if we don't allow some recourse for prior bad acts, I, I just, I. You know, I, again, I, I'm certainly fine with saying cases already been disposed of, or the case is in court right now, and it's not going to be affected by this new law. That would be really retroactive if you kind of really upset a case that's already being uh, decided. But I'm just worried about what we don't know. If you asked me five years ago. Right. Was there contamination in my neighbor's wells? I would have said, no, they probably got a better water than I've got, you know, from the town. And uh, you know, it turns out, you know, no one knew. And it, 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 it just, you know, look how, how much has happened. And we had already decided that that mm -hmm. would not be something that could be looked at. I'm really worried about about that. So I don't know if there's a way to say, I don't know how to write it. So Mr. Ronald, correct that under state statute 1 BSA 213 says the laws operate respectively unless it's expressly uh, provided that it applies retroactively. And you do retroactive laws every year. <coughs> and they have not been challenged. Well, they look, are constitutional. Look at that building over there. Somebody designed that. An architect designed that 50 to 100 years ago, right? Yeah. So, and we did do statute of limitations. Right. So that's this is what, um, under 1 BSA 214, the law does not affect any right, privilege, obligation, or liability acquired, accrued, or incurred prior to the effective date of the amendment of the repeal. So part of what may be a discussion that you want to have is when does the liability accrue for something like the PFOA releases in that event? When it, the contamination is discovered? Um, and that, that there, are, there are standards for that. As, as to when it triggers the statute of limitations that you were just discussing. So I think you have some opportunity if you want to write language in that. Well, I don't want to leave any futures mm -hmm. contamination. I mean, who knows? The products that we thought were just wonderful when I was a kid, one of them that comes to mind is the carrier from TAG is DDT. I remember when they banned it, my father going to the store and stocking up before they did it a lot of sales. I, you know, I'm a little worried about it, but I was pretty young then, and I didn't dare tell my father not to do it. But he thought it was a wonder thing to get rid of it stuff. It was. He got rid of a lot of stuff. Anyway, I, you know, I think of things like that. When it was first applied, it was a, you know, it was seen as just a wonderful thing, and. And I'm sure today we are using chemicals and we are using, I mean, who knows what the impact of, cells, of uh, cellular phones is on us that we're all using. Market constituents can value. Yeah, well, well I, I've got some constituents who have some real beliefs about the waves, but um, I won't go there. Um, but you know, who knows what might be discovered later. So I, I think it's important that there be some form of mm -hmm. that in the bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if we had done this five years ago, would it have completely exonerated? I mean, Same it wouldn't have, yeah, yeah. So we need, I think, we, Michael, please. I don't think we should make things worse than they are today. Right. Mm -hmm. Good I, motto overall. I can try to work on that. <laughs> so, so just to look at that, um, and I hate to keep talking about St. Cobain, but for the people who haven't filed 
Uh, how about if, if the uh, class action suit was withdrawn and started again? <laughs> well, um, are you saying with that somehow that they'd be outside the statute of limitations? Is that, is that your concern? No, that they could do it again. Based, well, I'm just thinking. Um, well, nobody's questioning them doing it now, so I guess. Well, there's already on. litigation ongoing right now. Right. And there's another provision in law that says um, the acts or repeals that you adopt do not affect the ongoing litigation. So the, the law at the time that, that that litigation was initiated will be the law that will be applied. Okay. That's helpful. But there, you can do some language around, like when it was discovered or when it was, whatever. Yeah, I think this, any statute of limitations should be after the discovery. After this one. Are there any other questions for the professor and lawyer? <laughs> and, uh, um, this is, you know, the, both both of you have been extremely helpful in identifying some of the issues. I don't know if they'll be satisfactory, um, whatever the committee comes up with, but um, it's been extremely helpful. And, uh, hopefully this morning we'll get further along. Thank you very much.